Please help me welcome to the stage Mikhail Svein, the CEO and founder of recently public company Zendesk, and Ingrid London from TechCrunch. Hello. Whoa. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Right. Um, so, Mikkel, thanks very much for joining joining us this morning. Um, now, you're you're you've got a a, a great book that's going to be coming out. I've been I've been reading through parts of it. Um, Thank you. In the lead up to today. Startup um, land, it's called. Startup land. Um, <clears throat> and so you you got you you and Zendesk are in an interesting position. You know vis-a-vis -vis the Dublin Web Summit, in that you came from Europe, um, and then you made your way over to Silicon Valley. So why did you decide to move the company? Why didn't you just start it, build it, grow it, take it public in Europe? Why, why the move to San Francisco? Um, so uh, we, we moved, uh, we moved uh, Sendesk five years ago to San Francisco, and, and the, the startup climate in, in, in Europe was very, very different just five years ago. You didn't have conferences like this, for example. Uh, the economy was not in a great shape, and uh, um, like raising money from VCs in Europe was a very, very hard discipline. So there was a sh huge difference between building a company in, building a technology startup in Europe and building a technology startup in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. They, you know, being in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, you are extremely privileged. You have access to all this fantastic talent. The weather is fantastic. Uh, you have access to all this, uh, all these VCs, to all these business development opportunities and so on. So there's no doubt that Silicon Valley, San Francisco is really kind of the epicenter of the tech startup world. But you know, beyond that, it, well, it, I think it's like we could not raise any money in Europe. <laughs> Even yeah. if we tried, no dice. It was right. impossible for us. Right. So, we're going to get to that in a minute. Yeah. I, I want to talk uh, on that subject of raising money in, in Europe in just a second. But um, before I do that, I would like to just know, would you do the same today? Do you think it's the same situation today as it was um, like five years ago? Or do you think that now, you know, we've got the Dublin Web Summit, we've got a lot of VCs um, all over, you know, the Nordics and London and Dublin and so on. Would you do it today? So, <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't, I haven't been so much in Europe over the last five years. I know that it's very different today. I know there's a lot more VCs, there's a lot more money flowing around, there's a lot of conferences like this, there's actual startup communities, and so it's, I think the, 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 the stage is very, very different today. But the question is, of course, like, does it have the staying power? Mm -hmm. As soon as the next correction in the economy happens, will all of this go away or will it yeah. remain here? There's no doubt that in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, they have managed through every correction in the economy and it's still the best place in the world to build a startup. Yeah. So there is staying power and stamina in, in San Francisco, Silicon yeah. Valley. And the question is, through the next correction, will what we have here today, will that be, still be around? Because that is ultimately what matters. Yeah, I mean, you yourself have first-hand experience of that. I think that you're probably maybe smarting in some way because you had a startup and the first dot-com bubble, didn't <laughs> yeah. you? Um, and and, and yeah. everything suddenly from one day to the other. What was the name of it? It's, it's, it was a great name. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an awesome name. <laughs> it was called K Kaput. Or Kaput. <laughs> it <laughs> and went it, Kaput. <laughs> and, and we didn't... Um, we didn't, uh, yeah, we went kaput. But, um, but that was in the dot-com days, and when the, when the bubble, the dot-com bubble burst, everything went away. There was yeah. nothing left. Yeah. Um, and, and like the whole, the whole platform for the industry just evaporated and, yeah. and took down every technology startup in Europe, basically. Yeah, I mean, the way that it was interesting, because the way you write about it, it wasn't just like our company lost our backers. No. It was literally your customers were filing for Chapter 11. Um, customers, partners, uh, so, everything yeah. just evaporated. Yeah, and then you had to. Yeah, we closed everything. down business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in in that in that book, um, you in, in in your book <laughs> in that situation, what you did was you after Kaput, you then went and started working for a company. I took a real job. Yeah, you took a real job. <laughs> And, um, None of this startup mumbo jumbo. No, exactly. Yeah. That was my first real job ever, uh, and that was a great experience. 
Um, but we implemented customer service solutions on yeah. um, um, help desk and customer service solution, both from the technology and the business process side. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was how I got into this industry of customer service solution. And that was what opened my, my, or my eyes for what a terrible, terrible state that industry was in, because this was also back in the days where nobody really cared about customer service. Like cu customer service was a cost center, and uh, it wasn't something that you actually used proactively to re-engage and, 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 and create a new type of relationship with your customers. So that was led us to build uh, Zendesk. Yeah, okay, so that actually ended up becoming the germination for Zendesk, yep. which we will move on to. Um, but how important do you think it is for people who are in startups to go out of being serial entrepreneurs and go into working for other companies? Because I think it's an interesting route. I, I've known people who have done that route, yours, and others who just persist at the startups. They never join the big company. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What, what do you think? Do you think it's an was an important part of how you grew I, I as, a, it, as an entrepreneur? I think it's, for, for me, it's formed my career. It's formed who I am today and, and uh, how I think of how I think about the world and, 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 and software. Um, so I, I definitely think that it's also like, sometimes you, you, you build something from reacting to something else. Right. And I think that what wor the world I saw there was clumsy, inefficient, very expensive, uh, traditional enterprise sales model, and, and at Sendesk was a whole reaction towards that. Right. So in many ways, it was a great experience and a great you know, igniter for us to, to build Sendesk. Yeah, probably like also just to figure out how operationally you fit, in, you fit into something where you worked under people. It probably helped you figure out how to manage people later. No. Yeah, not, not, not very good at <laughs> no, that. No, you're still no. a bad manager. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sure he's a good manager. Um, so, yeah, so back to how Zendesk was formed. You, you were in a business where you were working on customer service solutions. You saw something to disrupt. Yeah. That kind of leads me to questions about how do you come up with the good ideas for, for uh, startups, for an enterprise startup, do you feel like it, a lot of it is born out of disrupting the, 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 the stuff that's out there today? Do you think that there's, you know, is that, would, would you say that for, enter, for, for enterprise entrepreneurs that this is, a, this is the route that a lot of the most successful ones have come out of, or what? I think that there's a huge opportunity in kind of compressing the stack like it, all the stuff that used to be very complicated. I, I, everybody, here, everybody here can probably remember like how it was in the initial days when you had to dial up for the internet. Like you had a modem and the, you, you, had to under, you had to set up your TCP IP configuration and, and you had to use a PPOP client to dial up to the internet. And, and that whole like understanding all these things, like that we have democratized access to the internet today, so you don't have to think about that. When you buy a computer, you don't think about like what is the processor speed in that computer and how many, how many megabytes does it have. Like all these things, we don't think about them the same way as we used to. So we've democratized a big part of the stack, and the more we can democratize, the more we can say all these things that are so complicated, let's figure out a way of just making them super easy, intuitive, Let's build a beautiful user interface on top of it. Let's, let's really distill the business processes and, and what's lying underneath to just make things simple. I think that in itself, and we can see that with any part of technology, just making things more accessible for wider audience is in itself a business model. Yeah. Um, and I think like in our, in our example, what we did also was that we took something that was incredibly boring. <laughs> like we always yeah. we used to say like nobody picks up any checks in the help desk, um, and that was how it was. It was extremely unsexy the whole customer service industry, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody cared about it. It was a car center, so we took something that was incredibly boring, and then just by making it easy, transparent, straightforward, inexpensive, suddenly we made it sexy again, and suddenly yeah. it started to change how businesses interacted with their customers and suddenly they learned a lot from it and, and, and within a few years we, we managed to completely change an industry. Yeah. Um, and I think most ideas have already been taken. It's not like somebody will come up with a completely new idea. All the good ideas are already out there already. It's just about execution and making, finding the simplicity and making things easy and straightforward. Yeah. 
That's an interesting thing to say. All the good ideas have been taken. Yeah. In enterprise, you mean? Everywhere. Yeah, but I mean, don't you think technology is going to change that and create new problems and new, new things? No, I think you like... Think, you think business is fundamentally a pretty simple thing? <laughs> no, God, no, it's not simple. <laughs> but I think like, it's not like getting, like having an idea for a startup, it's not about getting a new idea. Right. You know, the, the best startups it's are, you know, well-proven ideas where they have just been executing on it. Like Facebook wasn't the f worst, the world's first social network. They were the third or the fourth of these yeah. social networks. They just executed on it really well and focused on what matters. And I think that's, that's, the, thing for, that's the thing for any type of company. Yeah. Okay, so you started Zendesk, which has a great name, especially in the context of you having started a company called Kaput. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you started Zendesk effectively in your kitchen or in a kitchen. Not, was it your kitchen or someone else's? No, it was else's? my co-founder, Alexander's kitchen. Okay, yeah. another kitchen. Yes. Um, in, in your co-founder's kitchen. Um, and it was basically three of you, right? Yeah. Kind of hanging out, doing this thing. At what point did you decide we can grow this thing? Did you let the business come first and then you grew? Or did you scale up to let the business grow? And I, you know, in essence, what I'm asking you, like in a kind of more general context, is when do you, how do you scale the business? You know, <laughs> what, when do you, when do you decide to grow? At which, what, what comes first? What's the chicken and what's the egg? Ah, it's an interesting question. Also because, like, so send us today. We are a publicly traded company. We went on the stock exchange in May of this year. Now today we are. Congratulations. Thank you. And and today we are a company with like 800 employees. We have offices in you know, 10 countries. We have 75 people here in, in Dublin. Um, so we're a big operation today. And we never perceived or had any idea about that we would be that big company five years ago when we were sitting in, in Copenhagen. Did you uh, know that you would end up moving the company to America either? I think we had like this American dream, like, we, right. like the, the tech crunch bug, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, but like back then, tech crunch was the only kind of startup resource and yeah, everybody it was, was like reading it. Yeah, it's like the only game in town. Yeah, exactly. Every, you were reading it, yeah. all these articles, and it was, like, it, was, it, was, like, it was really the holy grail. So mm -hmm. I think we had that bug and read about all these fantastic things going on. So, but like, a, a startup is just like, it's, it's one hill after the other. You know, you, you have this idea, you have this milestone in front of you, you have this goal in front of you, and then you reach the summit and you're up there and it's fantastic, and then you just realize there's just another hill behind it. And when you reach that hill, there's another hill behind that, and it never stops. Right. You know, it's, it's uphill, one hill at a time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun, <laughs> if you like climbing. <laughs> but I think it's like these guys doing Tour de France. Like, yeah. hey, I won! I up know. next morning, I know. another 400 miles, you know. Yeah. I, so so with, with, with you guys, though, <laughs> like, when did you... I, I, it, was it a challenge? Do you think it's a challenge? I, and I'm going to... There, there are various growth issues to building the startup. I'm going to move on to the funding <laughs> in a second. But um, is it, was it a challenge? Would you say that so a couple of things. Do you feel that like your your did you have a tr did you have a reputation for like having a complicated past with Kaput? Would, did that impede your growth in any way? Did people say no, no, no? He he messed up before, and and therefore we we, we don't want to work with him again. Or how how was it to h hire people? Was it easy or difficult? Or was so it, was when we were when we were when we were in Denmark, we were bootstrapping. It was basically just the right. three of us. We had a few people helping us and. Sometimes we paid them a little money, but like right. we were bootstrapping and, and it wasn't like we were building a company. It wasn't until we moved it to San Francisco that we actually, like we didn't have an office. We worked out of Alexander's kitchen for like two years. Right. And it wasn't until we moved to San Francisco and let like, we really start scaling it as a company. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, coming to San Francisco with no history, no friends, no network, <laughs> no nothing. I feel like nothing. you were starting the startup starting, from there. Starting completely over yeah. again. Was there a, a, a layover in Boston at some point? Yeah, or we am I had imagining we, that? two no. months in Boston. That's okay. Our very first investor was Charles River, who owned right. Boston. So we 
we, we were there for two months, but. Right, yeah. okay. And that was almost like a little mini incubation period with always the intention of moving on. Yeah, yeah, yeah more or less. Okay. Um, now, okay, so, so you got your first investment from the US. Yeah. What, did they, did you go to the US to get that investment or did they come to you in Denmark and say, we'd be happy to try to help you build this company, <laughs> but you have to move to America, then we'll invest in you. What, which one, how did it work? I w so we were pitching in the US for like a full year before we got the first investor. Gotcha. I was traveling back and forth. I spent almost one out of three days in the US. Um, and then finally, we, uh, finally, out of the blue, we heard from this guy called DevDot out of Charles River Ventures. Which is a great firm because it's obviously company. they've backed some of the, you know, they, they were Yammer's yeah. first investor. I mean, they're like a very, very important. It's a great company. For your and, type and, uh, of business. I had my phone number on our website and he basically just called me. Nice. And, uh, you know, one thing took, went to, took, to the, took the other and, and suddenly one day he flew into Copenhagen. And this was in 2008 and, and the credit crunch the, was really like Sequoia came out with this good times, rest in peace. Yes. And it was a terrible, terrible time <laughs> for startups. Um, but like we connected really well with DevDot and, and, um, and uh, he persuaded his partnership that they should invest in these three guys with really broken English and some product. <laughs> <laughs> so they met the, the first little investment and, and then one thing took the other. We got a lot of customers in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, what right. a lot of startups using, started using Sendesk, and that exposed us to a lot of VCs because now suddenly all their portfolio companies were using these yeah. companies. That's an interesting part of the whole it Silicon is. ecosystem. I, I've heard that so many times. But it's also a good investors. indicator. If you have a very interesting startup and you see them starting using some technology that makes, that changes their trajectory, there's something interesting in that technology. And so it's a good, it's a good way for VCs to kind of vet uh, new technology and um, so that was very lucky and so right after we got here like a couple three or four VCs wanted to preempt our CSP and they actually all flew into Copenhagen before we even had to make the move over oh. and uh, we, we finalized on uh, benchmark as leading our CSP and then that was a you know that was a fantastic uh, story and it's very different from trying to pitch them for one year and having a very hard time raising money, suddenly having everybody People knocking fly on in. your door. Yeah, that was a crazy period, but fun. Yeah, I mean, it's that I, which leads me to another question for you, which is about the whole idea of bootstrapping versus VC funding. And then VCs, how do you, how do you become a, a chooser rather than a beggar? And, and where is the, how do you know who the right investor is? Yeah. And have you, have you guys had investors that you wish you hadn't? You don't yeah. have to name names, yeah, but yeah. No, I mean, no. have you been through that process? And tell us about that. It, it's so hard, like, especially when you're bootstrapping because you're basically running out of money all the time. And, and you know, I, I met my wife and we had a couple of kids right in the first, right when we were launching uh, Sendesk. And, and, uh, and basically when we launched, we were running out of money all the time. I took a, a credit and, um, so you're so hungry for money. Also because like running a subscription service, SaaS is all about subscription services. Like it's not like you don't see a lot of money up front. So it's very, very hard to operate the business on your own cash flow. So it's almost impossible to do without some financing. Um, so we were really, really desperate for money for, for a long time. And, and we were very close to ending up with some investors that would have been a terrible idea for the company. But, but we said no and, and ended up, actually, we, before, we, um, before we did our first real investment, we, we went out to our family and friends and said, you should invest in our company. Mm -hmm. They and, said no. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and they all no. agreed to do it. And, and uh, that was a fantastic thing. But I, again, like, I would strongly recommend against that because that's a terrible thing to do. Like, because in 99% of the cases, they will lose their money. And, and they may be able to afford it the day they invest. But the day they lose their money, they may not be able to afford it. So uh, yeah. it's, it's a terrible thing to do. But in our case, it, it went really well. And they're all you know, in a very good position today, yeah. which is good. But, um, but no, I would advise against it. But it is like That's finding, finding your first investor um, is so important. And, and also because like, these are people that you're going to spend a lot of time with. Like we've, I still spend daily or monthly, uh, weekly or monthly, I still spend time with our, v with our early investors. 
And these guys, they know me really, really well. Like, they know all my oddities, they know my weaknesses, they know my strengths. And, and, and it's really like somebody compared it to a marriage. Like, it, it, it has to be people that you can be completely open to and can, that can respect you regardless of your oddities and your, you know, how you look in the morning and all these different things. Uh, <laughs> For those, those evenings where you have celebrity parties. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it really is like yeah. that, that it, like the, the early VCs are so important for a company. But so, but, but how do you know, are you saying that the way to do it is to just, you know, really get to know them before yeah. you do it one yeah. way or the other? Regardless of how much you need the money, you have to be selected? You, you really, re yeah. it's, it, it is a little bit like, like dating, you know, like it's like yeah. this, Finding a, an investor is not like it's not a one-night stand. It, it's 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 going to be a relationship over many many years. Yeah. So you have to do your work up front. You have to back channel them. You have to spend a lot of time with them over dinners or just walking with them or whatever, just to figure out what yeah. kind of people they are. Okay. Um, I think we're out of time, but um, I guess I can I just get one more question in or no? Running over. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's interesting to talk to you. But um, right. thank you very much. No, for thank you. Some time. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. everybody.